John Magne has lived and worked in Uganda for the last 32 years. Since 2008, he has served opportunity as senior agricultural specialist. In recent years, he has been involved in lobbying locally and internationally on issues related to strengthening the output markets in Africa. John has also been a private consultant for agencies including USAID and the World Bank. He's currently focused on opportunity agricultural operations throughout sub-Saharan Africa. Please welcome John Magne. Opportunity have been providing microfinance in, uh, from, in Malawi since 2006. Uh, I got involved in 2008 when they asked me to go down and review what they were doing. And uh, I, uh, I took that challenge, even though I knew nothing about microfinance. And um, from that, we developed a concept of how it will be done. Um, and I was invited to Chicago. And when I walked in, uh, Dennis Ripley said to me, uh, John, the reason why you're here is because uh, we saw what you did in Malawi, and now we want you to do it everywhere. Uh, and so they gave me the challenge of coming up with a way that we could actually support not only the, the smallholder farmers in Malawi, but in uh, the other countries as well. And fortunately, uh, the program which we developed was, uh, was taken up uh, by uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and jointly with MasterCard Foundation from Canada. And since o uh, October 2009, we've just started our rural financing program. Uh, it's to be done in five countries uh, over the next uh, four years. Now, the problem with rural finance, and uh, this is a list. I, I went to a conference in, um, uh, in Italy in September, and I sat there for three days to try and learn about microfinance and learn about rural microfinance, and I came up with all of these reasons why we shouldn't do it. <laughs> and I went back to, uh, to Dennis in, uh, in Chicago, and I said, Dennis, if you're going to ask us to do this, then we've got to, we've got to come up with a, a new strategy on how to mitigate all of this risk. But I can assure you this is a risky business. Now, I think the important thing is that Opportunity said to me, how can we be involved in Africa where we are ignoring 70% of the population by not supporting the rural uh, farmers. And therefore, that was the underlying uh, drive that made us come up and develop the scheme that we're, we are rolling out. This rural model is a very simplistic way of the way we look at it. We recognize that microfinance is only one element in uh, the rural model. And we effectively are just a lubricating system. Uh, I originally used to use this slide many, many years ago to try and explain to governments and donors why their projects failed, because they forgot about the other elements. Very often, they will provide extension services. Um, uh, Roger, in his book, actually talks about the scenario in Ethiopia where the Sasakawa Global 2000 Green Revolution actually encouraged the production and development of maize, but the market collapsed because they actually overproduced. The interesting thing about Ethiopia is uh, Roger talks about the 2003 famine, but a greater tragedy in Ethiopia in 2001 was actually the massive surplus that they produced that crashed the market. And the effect of the famine, uh, the, the effect of that crash meant that the commercial farmers in Ethiopia actually stopped producing because of their output market. So any of the opportunities we look at, we recognize that we only have a, a minor role uh, within the rural model and that we must develop the strategic links with all of the other partners who are in the rural er area, one, to mitigate our risk, but overridingly to provide as much support to our target audience, which is the rural farmers and farmers groups. The way we do this is we actually look at not just the agriculture that our farmers are involved in, but we do, we do three main things. We do household profiling, so we understand the family and the number of family members. Uh, members. So we understand what they need in terms of their food security, in terms of their, uh, the labor available within the family, and their cost for the other household expenditures that they have to cover. So we're trying to identify what their annual expenditure uh, is for their family. The second thing is, is that uh, 
When, uh, when we first looked at this in Malawi, I was given a list of 3,000 farmers. And those 3,000 farmers, I had very good data about them, but in the column for the number of uh, land area, it either said one or two acres. That does not happen. You can't get 3,000 families anywhere in Africa where they all have square farms. That only happens in America. Where you, and here you have a square mile. There they have one acre or two acres, but actually what they probably have is 0.6 of an acre or 1.2 acres or even 0.4 of an acre when they think they've got an acre. I tested it with a lady in, uh, in Malawi. I said, how much land do you have? She said, I have an acre. And she, I said, well, how do you know you have an acre? He said, well, I get a bag of seed and it has one acre on the outside and I get a bag of fertilizer and they said it, you apply it over one acre. And when I finish planting this in my land, I know I've got an acre. <laughs> it's, a very, it's a very fundamental thing. We have started doing mapping uh, in, uh, in Malawi now and the data that we're getting out of that, it means that we're able to treat farmers as individuals and treat them uh, their, their individual needs uh, on a one-to-one -one basis, even when we're looking after several thousand farmers. We also do crop profiling. Now, what this is, is taking the knowledge that we get from the extension services, the seed companies, the fertilizer companies, and the experience of the extension services in the field, and we identify as a mini business plan the productivity and the costs of producing on a single acre. Now, putting this together, we actually get a total farm plan, but we also get some idea of the household cash flow over an annual basis. This is actually a smallholder tea farmer. We're, we're currently working with smallholder tea farmers in southern Malawi. And one of the things I recognized is that, is that they, they, actually, let me just explain the chart first. This is zero. This is zero money within your, within your household. So at the beginning of the season, they have to take a very large loan to pay for their fertilizers. They actually get the blue line at the top is related to um, the income they get from selling their green leaf, and they get six months of income. So they've paid off their loan, and then they get into this area here, which is the savings. Now, what actually happens with the majority of those farmers is that their savings have disappeared by the costs of their household food purchases, education, health, even catastrophe within the family. So before they get back into an opportunity to earn income, they've actually run out of cash. And this is the most dangerous time for this family. If, if we don't think about this particular point, then what actually happens is that they will go to the money lenders, they will side sell their tea, and they will lose their annual wealth because of a lack of money. Now, this is a family that probably have an income of maybe $600 a year. They could lose up to 50% of that because of the, uh, the shock of not having no money and having to resort to money lenders to be able to uh, uh, survive until they get their next income. So this is the point that we have to identify. I see it in all of the countries we operate, in all of the crops, where the influence of side selling and money lending is actually probably the biggest danger that we have for our rural farmers. This is a maize farmer where he only gets uh, the opportunity to sell his maize once a year. Can you imagine only getting your income over a one or two month period and having to survive for food and survive financially for 10 months until you get to uh, the next opportunity to get a harvest? Unless you've got another source of income, unless you've got real savings, as you can see, their savings here is quite good because of this massive peak of selling uh, to harvest. But if the maize crop fails or the maize market fails, then the ability for those savings to survive until the, uh, the subsequent year is very short. This is a very interesting model. I've always known my farmers in Uganda were poor and this is bimodal production. We get two crops a year. Fantastic. A farmer with two natural crops a year. You would have thought they would be the wealthiest farmers in the world. But they aren't, actually, because what actually happens is they've only got 60 days to sell their crop and buy their inputs and do their planting. And if they can't sell because everybody else in the country is also selling their crop during that period, 
the market's very, very low, unless they have another mechanism to support their productivity, um, it means that they just are panic selling to be able to buy the inputs for the next crop. So bimodal production, and we have it in Rwanda, Uganda, and Ghana, is not the panacea that uh, we all think it could be or should be. So what's our focus? The first thing is, I think the most important thing is that uh, lots of the farmers in Africa have been trained on how to produce bigger, better crops. But actually, without the, the finance to improve that productivity, I've got lots of farmers who've been trained in, in intensive maize production. They can get five tons a hectare. They're getting two tons a hectare at the moment. The gap, apart, they need the training, but the gap is access to the finance to be able to, uh, to buy the seed and fertilizer to grow that crop. The second thing is, is to look at income smoothing. Now, in the urban areas, what we have is we have a situation where if you work in the town, and it's the, one of the reasons why people in Africa move to the towns, is that you may get your income on a daily basis or a weekly basis or even salaried over a monthly basis. So if you go back to our household financial cash flows, you're actually working very, very close to the middle. You may not be very rich, but you know that you're go if you do a bit of labor today, you're going to get some income today. But in the rural areas, the agricultural cycles mean the income comes in in large whammies, and um, uh, it has to survive a very long time, which is the importance, a very strong importance, of the savings element within our rural financial model. And uh, uh, if you don't want to come and listen to me, you definitely have to go and listen to Fleur about the savings products that we're developing for the rural finance. Household safety nets. This is our insurance products. And also, uh, we have a model which we're using in Malawi where at those points where we think the family are financially vulnerable, we actually inject cash into the system to stop them side selling and stop the money lending. So paying microfinance interest rates at 3% per month is better than paying a money lender 60% per month. And then diversification of activities. One of the things that our mapping and profiling thing does is it actually gives us a very good idea on how to be most productive and also to balance um, the types of crops, the types of incomes, um, and the, uh, the ability to uh, intensify your food security crops to release land for your cash cropping. And finally, the delivery, uh, the expanded delivery services. You'll see in our rural models, we have, we have village bank bankers, which are staff which stay in the village over the, over the week uh, to be there and to talk with everybody just for the one day that the mobile bank turns up. Uh, we're looking at mobile, uh, mobile phone banking. We're looking at uh, points of sale. Uh, we're looking at as many ways and as many cheap ways as we can to deliver the services to the rural areas. Rural finance in Africa, it's now our opportunity. Thank you.